Well, today we live in times when we want to refine and redefine, perhaps fabricate and refabricate the idea of India, of patriotism, and of sedition. We live in times where there are many champions of so-called traditional culture who want to believe that we have to go back to our traditional culture, that our culture is very pure, and anything which is Videshi, anything which comes from foreign lands, is a bad influence. They want to sort of beat up girls who wear skirts or jeans, and they want to kill people who, can, who keep beef in their refrigerators. I was in London last week, and I was asked, do you come from the country where you get killed for keeping beef in your fridge? I want to use the food we eat as my argument against fanaticism. I believe there is nothing more plural than the food we eat. There is nothing more plural than the Indian kitchen. I cannot give you a 20-course discourse on food, but I will try to restrict myself to a few course argument to make my point that India is a very, very plural culture, and the food, our kitchen, is more plural than anything. Actually, the food cooked by our grandmother and our great-grandmother is more foreign than anything else. There were a few entries in India which changed what we eat. This was in, on 20th of May, 1498, Vasco da Gama arrives in Calicut in a beach called Kappad. Now, this entry of Vasco da Gama, I mean, caused many things. Uh, Goa uh, was colonized by the Portuguese. Uh, the, uh, the Christian, we had conversions to Christianity. We have a lot of wonderful Indo-Portuguese houses which Delhi people come and buy now. All these things happened because of this entry of uh, Vasco da Gama. But one of the most important things which happened because of the entry of Vasco da Gama, he changed the food we eat today. In that sense, Vasco da Gama is actually a great culinary imperialist. Chilies. All of us try to uh, feel that chilies are from India, but chilies were brought by the Portuguese from Brazil, and Goa was a gateway to chilies. And chilies spread from Goa to the rest of the country. I have studied the story of chilies. In Vedas, there is no mention of chilies. In Upanishads, there is no mention of chilies. The next book was Kautilya's Arthashastra, which actually describes lots of different dishes. It talks about recipes, but everything is with pepper and the rest of the spices. The next book was Aine Akbari, which was written in 50, 1590 by, uh, uh, and it, is, it describes about 150 dishes cooked in Akbar's kitchen. And this book also talks about dishes only with pepper and the rest of the spices. There is no mention of chilies. Interestingly, the first mention of chili in Indian written word is in a poem by a saint poet by Purandar Dasa from Hampi. And this Purandar Dasa wrote this poem somewhere in 1555, and he says, oh chili, I have seen you become red from green. You have made my food so tasty and delicious that when I eat you, I even forget to utter the name of Vitthala. So that is a kind of, uh, I mean, kind of praise he showers on these chilies. And the chilies, I think, is one of the very few things in the world which went from one country to the other and entered every home. I think there is hardly anybody in this country apart from perhaps a newborn child which has not eaten chili. So chili, actually, if we have to sort of get rid of any foreign influences, the first thing we have to get rid of is eating chilies. <laughs> uh, you know, the idea, uh, the idea of the foreign culture, idea of pure culture, is a very foolish idea. It is like having a non-peeing area in a swimming pool. <laughs> hmm? So I have been sort of engaged with uh, chilies for a long time. I have created a lot of chili sculptures uh, this is with, done with truck tires. This is a chili with, uh, again, another truck tire chili. Uh, this is Vasco da Gama with moustache and uh, beard is with chilies. Uh, this is the strongest chili in the world called Bhut Jarotia. It's, uh, it's from Assam. The next thing is cashew nuts. I mean, I'm going to give a few examples. Cashew came from Brazil. Today, India is the largest producer of cashew in the world, and interestingly, Brazil is the largest producer of sugar in the world. And sugar cane went from India to Brazil, and one of my uh, scholar friends tells me that the first NRIs were some Govans who went and taught Brazilians how to grow sugar cane. 
They were first non-residents Indians somewhere in 1530s. Uh, the cashew, uh, the feni is very popular. This is a process of making cashew feni. Tobacco is brought from Brazil here. And here, this is the Vetar. Vetar is a sort of a ghost god which is celebrated, I mean, which is worshipped in many places. Now, in Goa, there is a tradition that this Vetar is given the offering of bidi, which is uh, tobacco, feni, and uh, chilies. The chilies and feni and tobacco is offered to Vetar. So I started thinking, before the Portuguese arrived, the poor Vetar was starving. Because we had absolutely no chilies, we had no tobacco, and we had no... The another the technology is the technology for getting rid of the evil eye. This did not exist in India before the Portuguese came. All the vehicles now having this limbu and chilies, and even in Goa, we have a tradition that a grandmother will have a mirchi, a chili, just around a child's head, and then throw it in the fire. So the technology of getting uh, rid of evil eye with chilies uh, was brought again by the Portuguese. The potatoes were brought by the Portuguese. The tomatoes, the vegetarian meal here is incomplete without uh, potatoes and tomatoes. Actually, when the tomatoes arrived here, the Hindus, the Brahmins, refused to eat tomatoes because they thought that when you cut a tomato, it looks like flesh. And so it was non-vegetarian. Uh, potatoes have a very interesting story. We have today in India, uh, we have about 1,000 uh, varieties of potatoes. There is a um, uh, germ spasm of uh, potatoes in a laboratory in Shimla. But then, the, when the potatoes arrived here from Peru, the first they were taken to uh, Europe. Uh, in Ireland, in the 19th century, there was a huge famine. And this was because, in this famine, almost the population became half. And this is because of a monoculture of potatoes. Because they only planted one type of potatoes, and the potato crop was affected by some disease, and uh, half the population had to sort of shift, and many people died. And amongst this migration of population because of these potatoes was the family of John F. Kennedy. He was Irish. Tomato ketchup has a very nice story. Tomato ketchup is a Chinese sauce called ketchup. And a lady called Anderson took it to America, and that's how they added spice to tomatoes and became ketchup. Uh, the peanuts were called badam e firangi. Even the badam actually comes from uh, Central Asia. Chikus are from Peru. Maize came from Brazil. Ananas is from Brazil again. Sitafar and Ramfar. This is a sort of re-questioning of the name. The original name from Peru is Ater. And in Goa, in Konkani language, it is still called Ater. Papaya. The most interesting thing which demolishes this idea of pure culture is Sabudana. All the the fasting food for all Hindus is sabudana khichdi. Now, sabudana comes from actually Brazil because it is made out of tapioca. And I won't be surprised that if you go to the priest after another 20 years, the priest will tell you for upas, for fasting, only, only Kellogg's. <laughs> yeah? So the next thing which sort of affected was Babar. Uh, Babar, the Mughal, came and conquered uh, Delhi in 1530. And Babur, when he came to Delhi, he missed the food from Samarkand. But then Akbar started missing the Indian food. Babur came with pulao. The pulao was the Central Asian uh, rice. Uh, the, that's what they used to cook. And this pulao got married with the Indian spices, with the masalas, and became biryani. So biryani was born in Delhi, out of the marriage between pulao. And this pulao went to Spain and became paella rice. It went to Italy and became risotto. The, the melons which Babur loved so much, the biryani, the halwa comes from Central Asia, it's Arabic. Jalebi is from Persia. Samosa, the idea is Arabic, but the batata, potato inside is from Brazil. Uh, kebabs. See, basically, I'm trying to make a point that what we eat has come from so many places, and if we have to basically talk about pure culture, we have to abandon most of the things. I was invited to, uh, to Portugal to create an installation in a garden called Tapada das Necessidades. So what I did was I want to take a poetic revenge on the Portuguese because they changed the food we eat. So I took rice, I took rice from Goa and planted it in the garden in Portugal, in Lisbon, in the form of the sea root of Vasco da Gama. So, <laughs> so when, so when, so when the, when the rice grew, when the rice sprouted, it did not sprout rice, it sprouted history. So let me end by just telling you that before even we think of a Ghar Vapasi program, we have to create a food Vapasi program. <laughs> Thank you very much.